Hey, and welcome. My name is Emily Bagwell. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm calling in from Atlanta, Georgia, and I work with Reconciling Ministries Network. I'm the resource manager, and one of the joys of my job is getting to do these virtual porch sessions. It is a space that we have created um, through the pandemic and now beyond uh, to bring uh, creative and beautiful um, people to come and host different topics um, as we all seek to journey together and learn and grow and be spirit led together. And so I'm very glad and thankful for tonight's opportunity to gather in this virtual space and welcome you all and welcome our facilitator for the evening. JJ Warren is joining us um, to have what I know will be a, a dynamic and um, inspiring conversation um, that will lead us all to um, maybe think in some new ways um, and ask some new questions um, and just to be thankful for the work of of God in his life and also in um, just the the spirit of, of God at work in the world, um, especially in the lives of queer and trans people. Um, we are grateful for people like JJ um, who take leadership um, and really uh, just invite folks into some intentional spaces of community. So tonight um, we are going to have this platform of um, the, the virtual space of, of Zoom as it is. So the chat function will be open throughout our time. If at any point you have a question that you would like to ask or have um, a time of, of JJ reflecting on something specific, if you will make that known in the um, chat and I will be monitoring that throughout our time. Um, JJ might incorporate it in just to what he is sharing in the moment, but we'll definitely have some time towards the end for a QA. and a um, So if something didn't get answered, that will be an additional space for us to um, address any questions that we have or curiosities um, towards JJ so that he can uh, respond and engage with this community. Um, so he does have a lot to share chair and so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him just want to make a note that we are recording tonight so that others might um, enjoy uh, the conversation at a later point we know it's a busy season of pride happy pride everyone um, as well as many annual conferences are meeting um, and you know summer is often a time when people are on the go and so we are grateful that you have made the time and the space to be with us um, this evening and look forward to the conversation so let me welcome JJ and say thank you for being here We're we're so glad um, to have this time with you. Um, I'm going to let JJ say a lot more, but to, JJ has a lot of different roles um, within the United Methodist Church and within the just church world in general um, is doing a lot of wonderful, wonderful things. And I just want to shout out and specifically celebrate that he was just commissioned this past week um, in his home annual conference, um, but is here in the United States right now um, as a visitor in many ways, because he is uh, residing, uh, residing abroad, um, working on his PhD work. So I'll let him share more about what all he's up to and uh, what it, what his life involves and, and looks like these days. JJ, thank you for taking the time to, to be here and to share with us this evening. We're gonna hear about Young Profits Collective and so much more of, of what you're up to. Um, so say more uh, about who you are and what you wanna share with these good people um, this evening and uh, you can get started with what all you wanna share. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. If uh, if everyone who's listening, if you can do the little reactions at the bottom and give a little heart to Emily and RMN for hosting these virtual church, uh, virtual porch sessions and for all of the work that you all do. You know, my my home church is still going through the reconciling process in upstate New York, and it has been such a gift to know folks around the connection, to say, listen, I get to see firsthand United Methodists who are doing this work of saying, including and affirming LGBTQ people is part of what it means to be the church. And I get to experience that in churches. Many of you, I've been to your churches, I see. Uh, and so, you know, I've got to see it all over the connection, uh, including most recently in Moheto, Kenya, with the first reconciling church on the continent there. And it's just, it's such a gift that Reconciling Ministries Network exists. So I just want to thank you, Emily, for hosting this and for all of the work that you do at RMN and Izzy and all of the coordinators and everyone there. So yes, thank you all for doing the heart reaction uh, and engaging with me in that way. 
Now, I know that we're not together, but I still got to take a selfie. If you know me, you know I take a selfie everywhere. So I am going to put on a view where I can see everyone. If you're comfortable taking a selfie, uh, would you mind uh, turning on your camera so that we can get a cute little selfie with all of us in here? Evergreen from Young Profits uh, is our uh, unofficial minister of muscle. They are flexing already for this selfie. So if you are comfortable taking a selfie, please uh, turn on your camera and we'll get that cute selfie going. I'm still old school, so I have to do it with my phone. I know we're here talking about virtual church, but I'm here with this, uh, yes, selfies, I'm old school, beautiful. Okay, love it. Thank you all, love these beautiful faces. Ah, uh, looking good, looking good. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Now you can eat your popcorn or whatever you were doing before you turned your camera back on, <laughs> okay. Um, or you can leave it on because I also like looking at you. You know, you're beautiful. Um, and yes, please feel free to chat in the chat there um, and we'll have some Q&A time at the end. Uh, as Emily said, my name is JJ Warren. I use he, him pronouns. I have the joy uh, of being the executive director of Young Profits Collective. And in a minute, I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, and what we're doing these days to equip and empower young LGBTQ people and the young at heart uh, around the world. Uh, but before I get into that, I... Many of you I know from after General Conference 2019, that's our big gathering in the United Methodist Church, uh, where not much usually happens except a lot of pain, um, so there's that. But after that, I uh, said a few words that a few people around the world happened to hear, uh, and I then had the chance to go to churches and conferences and colleges and talk about LGBTQ inclusion in places I never dreamed of going. So our connection, uh, our UMC folks and our non-UMC folks are amazing, and it's just been a beautiful journey. Uh, after that, I, I was asked by the United Methodist Publishing House to write a book to say, how can churches and individuals go through this queering process um, to understand and carefully look at our understanding of the Bible? Because, right, for many of you, perhaps you also feel like when folks say that LGBTQ people don't believe in the Bible, we know that's false. We know that we do. Uh, and we all come to the Bible with a particular lens. So that book uh, in which I go through all of that, um, how we deconstruct some of the clobber passages, but also how we can reclaim church as a place of safety, liberation, and radical love, uh, it is aptly titled Reclaiming Church. So if you haven't read that yet, uh, you can feel free to check it out from a local bookstore, uh, not from Amazon. So uh, it's called Reclaiming Claiming Church, you can find that at a local bookstore. Uh, any bookstore should be able to order it for you. Aside from that, my other hat that I wear here, uh, although I don't wear hats because I'd mess up the hair, right? Uh, the other hat that I wear is that I am a PhD student at the University of Vienna in Austria, where I study systematic theology, which is just a fancy way of saying we try to make things make sense. Uh, and so I try to make things make sense, uh, and I work particularly with the theology of Paul Tillich and queer theology and bringing them into conversation to talk about what it means for the church to understand itself as fundamentally queer and how that would change the way that we embody church together, which leads us perfectly into our work at Young Prophets Collective. So I'm very glad that you all have joined me and that you're interested in learning a bit more uh, and to see what else you can apply wherever you are to build affirming spaces online for LGBTQ people uh, and for folks around the world uh, in your communities. Um, yes, there is an audio book as well. Uh, so you can also listen to that while you're on the treadmill. Although, you know, they made me speak in that slow, boring voice. So maybe while you're going to sleep, you can listen to it. Um, so before I, before I get further into Young Prophets Collective, um, yeah, I, I just want to share with you um, our, our mission statement and some of the work that we're doing. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on a few different things. First of all, I'll tell you a bit about our mission and why we do what we do and how we do it. 
Um, and so you can understand the intentionality that goes into the community that we try to create and hopefully some principles and themes that you can also use in your context, um, but also invitations for you to engage with this work uh, locally um, at your church or to get other young folks to be part of the programs here. So I'll talk about our Young Profits cohort a little bit for a few minutes, and then I'll talk about our new um, online faith community that is just starting. Uh, as Emily mentioned, I was recently commissioned last Friday. Uh, so that's like our residency program in the Methodist Church uh, before we're fully ordained. So I'm a pastor, hence this cute little color uh, in the United Methodist Church now, uh, one of the lovely queer pastors in our denomination, like Izzy and Emily and so many others. Um, and so, yeah, part of what I do now is this new online faith community, uh, and we meet in a virtual space that we've curated, uh, and it feels, I hope, a bit like a church so that folks have some sense of home, And but we'll get into that in a little bit, and I'll take you into that virtual space. But for now, um, as, as you have questions arise, feel free to put them in there uh, in the chat. I'm going to start with our mission statement of Young Prophets Collective to give you kind of an overview of who we are, what we try to do, uh, and what we believe. So if you can see this, uh, give me a physical thumbs up or a thumbs up react. Um, but I'm going to tell you, I'm as I say to all the groups that I visit and to Young Prophets, we are nerds and I embrace nerdiness. So uh, we have to define all of our terms. So I'm gonna briefly define this mission statement in a second. But as a little bit of background, Young Prophets Collective started right after General Conference 2019 when I realized that there were not many young people able to speak on the floor. And after the conference, many young people, particularly young LGBTQ people around the world said, you know, we." We still have a place in this church, we have a voice, and we need some community to say that we are here, that even though the conferences that speak for the church are silencing us or trying to silence us, we are here and we still have a voice. So what can we do together? What can we do? Uh, and in a response to that question, Young Prophets Collective emerged. Um, and, and so it really was born from General Conference 2019. It took me a hot minute to learn all about creating a nonprofit. So we officially became a nonprofit in uh, May of 2021. Uh, and since then, uh, we've led this program that I'm going to tell you a bit about in a minute. But what we exist to do, our mission says, is to equip and empower a global community of young LGBTQIA plus religious leaders and young allies who use their prophetic voices for liberation. And as I said, I'm a nerd, so we're going to uh, dissect each of these words and define what we mean. What does it mean to equip? What does it mean to empower LGBTQ people around the world? And what, what is a prophetic voice? And what exactly is liberation? Who, who grounds our understanding of these concepts? So to get into it, to start, equip base, essentially means, according to Oxford languages, to supply the necessary items for a particular purpose. And so we ask ourselves at Young Prophets Collective constantly, what are the necessary items for the purpose of liberation? What do we need for everyone to feel free? What is needed for this journey of justice? And it's not an a question that we have an immediate answer to, but that we're constantly asking and reflecting upon. What are the necessary items for the particular purpose of liberation? We believe one of them is community, hence why we do a lot of community building work of young LGBTQ people. How many of you grew up in a small town? I grew up in a small town in rural upstate New York, where I'm currently back for a few days, uh, and I did not know other LGBTQ people. So the first places where I experienced authentic community were online. So online has always been a space where I've turned to find authentic community, hence why we understand it as one of the necessary tools uh, for this particular purpose of liberation. Another is education, and we'll talk a bit more about that in our cohort program. So what does it mean to empower, to make someone stronger, more confident, 
especially in controlling their life and claiming their rights. When we say we exist to empower LGBTQ people, it's to make us all stronger, more confident in controlling our lives and claiming our rights. Now, many of us are in towns or communities or churches where controlling our lives is not something we've had a lot of agency to do before. Uh, and claiming our rights is something that's been discouraged, or as we see in the politics across the US uh, and across the world right now, uh, is something that's being actively taken away. So when what we understand by our work of empowering is to assist others in controlling their own lives and claiming their own rights to build others up, to provide those necessary items like community and education for this work of empowerment so that everyone would be free. Now, as we come towards the end of the statement, what does it mean to be prophetic? And this is uh, my offering of a definition. So, you know, you, you can't find it in Oxford languages. I'm sorry. If, if you feel like citing me, you could. I don't know how much good it would do you, but this is what I have to offer here. When we think about prophecy, what it means to speak prophetically, I believe that prophetic, to speak prophetically, is to speak the uncomfortable and often inconvenient truths to people and systems of power. And here comes the Wesleyan United Methodist part. To speak these uncomfortable and inconvenient truths with grace and love. To speak the uncomfortable and inconvenient truths with grace and in love, motivated by a deeply con divine conviction for justice. So everything that we do here is supposed to be, is aimed towards everything that we do and the ways in which we go about doing it. The ways in which we talk about justice ought to be oriented, we believe, toward making a more just world, one that is shaped by and reflects God's radical love for all creation. And this is informed by activists in the field, in communities. You know, we there's this catchy slogan out there that we don't just call out folks, but instead we ought to call each other in to say, how can we call each other into conversation? Not just to say, hey, you used the wrong pronouns when you were talking about me. Hey, I want to invite you to, yes, take the bold step to say, hey, you misgendered me. And I want you to know um, that my pronouns are actually they, them. I value you as a relational partner and I want you to know this um, so that you can do better next time. And then what is our... What is the role of the person on the receiving end of that conversation? If we're being called in not to respond out of fear or anger or embarrassment, but to say, you know, to be in this community that's grounded in grace and love to say, wow, thank you. Thank you so much for going out of your way to correct me because I value and love you and I will work to do better because I value, I see you, I love you. So that's part of how we understand the prophetic work uh, that we're called to. And finally, liberation. Simply put, liberation is the action of setting someone free from imprisonment, slavery, or oppression. It is release. Now, of course, because we're theology nerds, uh, some of us here, we have to pull in some theology. So uh, some folks may have heard of Gustavo Gutierrez. He is from Peru. He is a Catholic theologian, a liberation theologian, considered one of the founding fathers for parents of liberation theology, which was a movement within Latin American uh, Catholicism, mainly uh, within the 60s, around the 1960s. Uh, and when he talks, when Gutierrez talks about liberation, he says the goal, and I'm quoting him here from his book, A Theology of Liberation, Gutierrez says the goal is not only better living conditions, a radical change of structures, a social re revolution, it is much more. It is the continuous creation, never ending, of a new way to be human. It is a permanent cultural revolution. And I just love that. It gives me goosebumps every time. The goal of liberation is the continuous creation, never ending, of a new way to be human, a permanent cultural revolution. So if we put all of these words together to understand our mission statement, 
We believe that our mission at Young Prophets Collective is to provide the necessary tools for the claiming of our rights of LGBTQ people, of people at the intersections of different identities, of Black, Indigenous people of color, of people around the world, to help everyone claim their rights and all of creation to be respected as a global community of young LGBTQIA plus religious leaders and allies who speak the uncomfortable and inconvenient truths to people and systems in power, in grace, and with love, so that we would participate in the permanent cultural revolution of a new way to be human. Amen and amen. And if you do a little, little amen in the chat, I'll know you're still awake and I haven't bored you yet. So that is what we believe we are called to do here at Young Prophets Collective. And part of the way that we live that out is through our six-week develop, uh, leadership development program. So this has changed over the years. It used to be a year long, and slowly it's evolved. And so what we do is our participants, Young Prophets' six-week uh, curriculum seeks to equip LGBTQIA plus religious leaders and allies to speak from the intersections of the various identities of folks that come to our communities for this holy work of liberation. So this group of, it's about 10 to 12 young people. So we believe that's around 18 to 40, though we always have some folks that fall outside that category. So 18 to 40. Uh, and let me just copy a link here for you. We believe uh, that our six-week cohort is part of how we live out this call. And our current cohort, the fall 2023 cohort, the application just opened today, and the deadline is Friday, July 28th. That can be accessed on our website. The link is there in the chat. So part of what we do at the cohort is we meet together. So it's about 10 to 12 young adults, 18 to 40-ish years old. Uh, and everyone comes into this program with an understanding of a prophecy project. So we ask everyone to in the application to say, what is an injustice in your community? Whether that's your physical, geographical, local community, or a community online, an affinity community. What is an injustice uh, that you see and that you feel called to address? And how can you do some deep listening over these next six weeks with folks in the community? Right, We're very much informed by the asset-based community development program, which means you don't go in and say, let's solve all your problems, here's some programs. But we do deep listening to say, what do you need? What are the expressed desires of your own community? And hopefully you're a part of that community. Um, so it's not like you're going to some community far away and imposing some outside uh, conversations, but you're asking amongst your own community, what do we need here? What resources already exist? What teachers do we have? We use this in our uh, worship space too, as we're starting worship. You know, who do we have in this community? What trainings, what, what, potential? What, what things do folks feel called to do here? And so all of our 10 to 12 participants, um, it's it sounds daunting, but it really, uh, it's not meant to be. They come in and with two sentences, you say, you know, I'm, we had someone who said that I'm working at a church, I'm a trans Asian American man, and um, I would like to lead a Bible study for folks who are interested, um, who are Asian American and queer and would like to learn more um, or would have a community space to grapple with those identities uh, and the shame that has been involved at the intersection of those identities. And so we said, great, that's your prophecy project. What we do over the six sessions, they're every other week, so it's about three months long. Um, what we do is each week we read different texts. So we read some Gutierrez, we read some other uh, theology texts, we read some other um, articles or paintings, we interact with art um, and social media from activists uh, to gain different skills and insights to say, uh, how can we better and more justly engage in our local communities in the work of justice, whatever that justice work is that we're called to. Um, and so for example, for that Bible study program, it first started out with the theme. And then as the weeks went on, the facilitator um, 
is there to assist the group to engage in the dialogue and to provide feedback. So it's an ongoing Google Doc where these prophecy projects are um, and these ongoing Google Docs. So you get feedback about the work and the questions that you have as you're doing it. So they said, you know, should I meet in the church or is that um, a, a triggering space? What are some ways that we can think through that? Should we have food? Should we not have food? Should we do it at a time when other groups are meeting so that you know people don't think, oh, it's only the queer people going at this hour and they could come to the church and know? All of these questions we were able to talk about one-on-one -on -one, um, with the participants as they're developing these projects. So you have someone to talk this through. Um, and so that's part of how this cohort program goes. And if you have have any questions, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts about that. Um, so if you have questions about this program, uh, put them in the chat. I'll, I'm going to share a brief two-minute video from one of our participants to decenter me and uh, my voice as it gets tired uh, and to center one of our participants uh, from the community. And let me know, I'm going to stop share and then share that video. Let me know if you can see that. But if you have any questions so far about the cohort program, um, please feel free to put those in the chat so we can see them. And I'll, I'll just mention, so that's about six weeks long. The deadline for this year's application is July 28th. The program costs $100. Normally, churches, local churches are able to assist um, the participants in that. We have a small handful of grants uh, that we also can do. Um, but if your church, so if you don't have any young people in your church that would be interested in this program, but you say, hey, my church has a hundred bucks, how about we sponsor someone? That's something that we're looking to help build, to build partners, to say, how can we help make this program accessible to more folks? Last year, we had participants from three different countries. Uh, so we had folks from all of the United Methodist jurisdictions in the U.S., and we also had folks from Uganda and Kenya. We had two trans women in Uganda who lead a homeless shelter there uh, for other trans folks. And as many of you might know, Uganda just implemented uh, a law that punishes uh, homosexuality by death. Um, and so that's very much part of the work that we are doing and trying to understand our relationship in that, how we can support our our alumni there, uh, but how can we continue to support and make this program accessible to folks around the world? So that's something to consider. And as you think about that, as you write your questions in the chat, here is our uh, a, a few words from one of our participants. And if you could give me a thumbs up if you can hear this once it plays. Hi, my name is Casper. I am part of the Young Prophets Collective cohort uh, fall 2022. And so my prophecy project is creating and LGBTQ Bible study for Asian and some Asian Americans uh, in my community in the uh, area. Um, there were some constraints in this Bible study that actually made it kind of a logistical challenge for me and something that I was really struggling with. Um, and it wasn't, you know, not just that it was for Asians and Asian American Christians um, who are queer, but also that there could be, you know, very positive attendance from outside of my church. Um, and it wasn't a group where I wanted to uh, draw people, you know, out of their home churches and into mine, um, because I know there are very, you know, good reasons someone might not want to leave a church that isn't affirming, um, and I didn't want to take them out of that church that they, you know, served in or had a commitment to. I wanted to honor that journey, um, but give people a safe space to kind of feel affirmed and um, loved and uplifted um, as their queer selves. Um, but it did mean I was having a lot of trouble conceptualizing what such a Bible study might look like. Um, I had full support, or I have full support from my pastor um, and the director of administration. But I needed a little bit more help kind of figuring out what such a group might look like. Um, but the process of creating this prophecy project was super rewarding. Um, working with JJ helped me uh, figure out what I wanted out of this group and kind of how I wanted it to look, um, while also making sure that we would serve the community that I was asked to serve and that I want to serve. Um, there are a lot of moving parts that I hadn't considered or that I had thought about that I didn't know how to tackle. Um, there were things like, what should we study in such a Bible study? Um, because everything, when I was searching, um, was all like, oh, you can look at the clever verses, you can get like, you know, these things that are important to look at, but might not be affirming for someone who's super positive. Um, I didn't want to look at, you know, I didn't want to create a space that is just telling you, you know, that the Bible doesn't love you in any ways you might already hearing from other people. Um, so you help me kind of queer the, uh, the process a little bit. So instead of, you know, studying clever verses or studying, you know, what's my um, uh, regular Bible study, organization, <laughs> um, we decided that I would bring forth um, kind of uplifting and affirming verses and have people just talk story about 
um, how those apply to their lives, how it applies to the most, you know, queer people, and just how they connect to the Bible as, you know, holy and holy themselves. Um, I had other things too that I was thinking, but maybe didn't serve my community quite right. Um, I had originally named it something kind of silly. Um, it was joyful, but it was silly, but AJ kind of guided me into thinking, okay, well, if you're serving an Asian American community, maybe you should name it something that kind of speaks to that community rather than something that is maybe more broadly palatable for, you know, issues of all reasons of the community. Right? <laughs> you know, like I wanted to, like, he, he asked me to think about things that were um, more specific to my group, my the people that I wanted to serve. Um, it was a several week process, but it was one that was very fruitful, and I definitely couldn't have done it without Jesus' leadership. Um, the way that he asked me to think deeply and carefully about all aspects of the Bible um, really helped me create something that I'm proud of and something that I think and hope will serve my community. Um, it's been a great and super rewarding process. Um, I was actually hesitant about applying to the Nonprofit Collective when a mentor in my community sent me the link um, because I didn't know much about the group. I didn't know how it was serving. I wasn't sure of what benefit I would get out of it. Um, but with JJ and the Collective, with the connections I've made, with the things I've learned in the cohort, the books I've read, um, I've created something that I'm really proud of and something that I'm really excited to get started with. Thank you. So that was Casper, uh, one of our participants from the fall 2022 cohort. So if you have any questions um, and we will, uh, this will be recorded. So if you couldn't quite get that, um, you can watch the video again uh, with captions. And we also have it on our website, uh, which I can send that link again. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about our cohort program and what we do. Are there are there any questions from anyone? JJ, there are not, there, there's not any in the chat um, just yet. So I'll ask a question to give people maybe an opportunity um, to jot down a thought or a question or a topic that you'd like to hear JJ reflect on. Um, so JJ, I know that often what we have is a lot of people who are in churches who um, you know, may or may not, well, just keep it that open, have young people coming, attending a part of um, their congregations. And so I hear from you that Young Prophets Collective is an opportunity for, to really, in all the words that you said, empower and um, equip and um, kind of practice that prophetic um, voice. Um, so this is just such a great space to connect with um, others and um, have guidance and mentorship. It, it, it sounds like a lot of that is what happens. Um, and, you know, when, when people are in local churches, I would love to hear you just reflect on what are some things that, that you have experienced to be positive and meaningful um, for young prophets in their local settings? What can a church do? What can lay people do? What can pastors do to help create um, more welcoming, affirming, and inviting space for that prophetic voice um, to, to find its way into the culture and community um, in a local space as well? Do y'all talk about that in Young Prophets Collective at all? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Emily. Um, it's interesting. So, most of our folks are United Methodists. We also have some Episcopalians, uh, some folks from other traditions as well. A lot of them, because it's uh, young adults, they, they've they grown up in the church. They they don't necessarily attend one, um, understandably, uh, because of, you know, so many bad experiences. But some of them, we've, you know, we've had some pastors, some deacons, um, some lay people, as you heard from Casper, who are part of churches, um, and I think one of the the biggest things a church can do is to provide the space for others to lead. And by others, specifically here, young LGBTQ people. So not to say we're going to offer this program or this luncheon, but to say how can the folks who we want to serve lead? Because many of us young folks have things that we're passionate about that we want to share, but we just don't have the space for. Um, and I'm sure that's true across all of our ages, actually, that all of us have things that we're passionate about. And we maybe have spaces where we don't feel like our perspectives are valued. One pastor really changed, uh, opened my mind to this concept. Um, it was actually at Barb's church uh, in Boulder. Um, and 
He said, you know, I was at a church where they said, we want more young people involved. They had one young person on the church council and they thought that was enough. They didn't understand why that one young person wasn't speaking up. Uh, or when we did call on them specifically, uh, why they didn't have these magical answers to get more young people. And he said, he said, he asked the church, do you trust me? And they said, yes. Uh, and, and so he said, okay, will you trust me to do something radical? And they said, yes. And what he did was he replaced half of the church council with people under 35, half of the church council with people under 35, because he said, and I remember feeling this way as a young person, as the only young person on my church council, uh, that I was there to maybe add a voice and input occasionally, but to actually give institutions power away is something that the United Methodist Church is learning in this time, and many of us have to learn and unlearn, is how to give actual institutional power to the folks who we want to serve who have not been served or affirmed in the church. So that's that's one way uh, that I've found moving from someone else's experience uh, to say, how can we give actual institutional power? And I think Casper's project um, is an example of that, to say, okay, Let's have someone from within the community who feels called to lead, lead this Bible study. And of course, this isn't a one size fits all because you don't just want the one open trans person to have to lead everything about LGBTQ rights, right? So it's it's still about sharing the load, but it's the invitation to lead, I think, is is the first step of how we go about sharing some of the power that's held within our structure in our churches. Thanks for sharing that. It's a beautiful uh, response. Um, I'm not seeing any other uh, specific questions. Do you want to share with us now, maybe turn to your virtual space? And uh, I know you mentioned kind of giving a, a tour of a little bit of maybe talk for a minute about what, what does online uh, Young Prophets Collective look like um, and leading us through um, that. Yes, fabulous. And thank you all for sticking around for this uh, entire uh, session so far. I'm really grateful. Um, this, it it's a transition, but it's a perfect um, transition, a perfect continuation of the work that the program does. So we had this Young Prophets cohort program where 10 to 12 young adults um, get together and build intentional community. Uh, and what we found was a lot of these folks, um, that's the only affirming space that we have where it's predominantly LGBTQ young people. Um, and what we found was we needed to fill this gap, not to take people away from churches. Um, so our services are not on Sundays. Um, I've had people ask me, is that because you're Seventh-day Adventist or because you're yada yada? Um, no, it's actually, surprisingly, from the theologian, it's not a theological reason, it's a practical one, uh, that we don't want to take folks away from churches who are in churches, um, but we also wanted to offer a sustained community that's intentional for for LGBTQ plus folks and allies. Um, and I say young, it's predominantly folks who are within 18 to 40, but we also have some boomers in there. Uh, I think one of them's in here. Uh, and uh, honestly, we have a great time. So you are welcome to come. And I'm going to share some of those links in the chat right now. Um, and so, yeah, anyone of any age is welcome. We try to keep it as an intentional community. Um, so you'll see mostly young LGBTQ people leading the service, um, but everyone is invited to participate with the caveat and the important disclaimer that Anyone is welcome to participate who can affirm that LGBTQ people, that people of color, that indigenous people are made and valued in the image of the divine. Um, and so that that is the threshold that we set, uh, that part of the intentionality of the space uh, is that we you can click this link uh, and anytime an admin is present, you can you'll be uh, admitted and you'll be asked. Simply put, you know, do you affirm queer people? Uh, and if your answer is no, uh, then we'll say, well, thank you so much for stopping in. If you'd like to have a conversation, here's Pastor JJ's office hours. You can feel free to schedule a meeting. And if not, 
uh, then farewell. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, and that's the threshold of safety, because that's what we understand the church ought to be, uh, and this community ought to be. Yes, there are churches out there where folks who are homophobic, quite frankly, or transphobic, can go and, you know, find the spirit. And we bless them to go into their own communities. And also, this is a space that is intentionally for LGBTQ plus folks and allies. And so that's just the, the disclaimer that we give folks at the beginning. So we developed this online space. I'm going to take you there now. Uh, and what I like about it, as I uh, get to it, you know, we, we do all this technology stuff and then I always fail at the last minute to take us there. So I, I can't tell you how many virtual worship meetings we've had where I find out two minutes into the mini sermon, we only do a five minute sermon, uh, that my mic has been muted. So uh, I always say the best stuff is when I'm muted. Uh, so they missed all the good stuff and get, get the other stuff. Can you see this screen? Okay, fabulous. So this is our virtual space. Now, there are some links in the chat that explain to you how GatherTown works. That's the platform uh, that we created this space in. Uh, we curated this space. We designed it to feel like a church, to provide a touchstone um, of home uh, while it's intentionally young, LGBTQ affirming and inclusive. Uh, so everyone, once they enter this space, and some folks who uh, around my generation play uh, Pokemon, they say it feels like Pokemon. Uh, and so it's, I love it. I think it's fun. It's the darndest thing. Um, but what I like about it, as opposed to Zoom, is that there's space. And what I mean by space is that we are not all locked in a Zoom room together and, and we can't leave. Zoom is great, um, but probably maybe some of you have felt the Zoom fatigue during the pandemic and it, it doesn't feel as natural because you can't have those spontaneous conversations. So one of the things that we've tried to capture and the reason that we've chosen Gather Town uh, intentionally is because of the spontaneity. It allows for a physical, not, it allows for a space. I almost said physical because it feels so real. Um, it allows for a space where folks can go to gather and still have their own space, their own personal space. So you are never trapped in a Zoom room with everyone. Um, you can go off to your area um, and and feel free to take a minute. Or as Evergreen is demonstrating, um, when Evergreen comes close to me, when we come close to one another, uh, once they <laughs> get off, <laughs> uh, go cart, um, Evergreen's camera will turn on and mine will turn on. You'll see this little, um, face here. Can you see that? Um, so in that way, it's like a FaceTime call. If you get close to each other, your face and microphone can turn on and you can have a conversation just like at church at coffee hour. So you can bump into each other, say, oh, hey, Evergreen, I haven't seen you. How was the queer gym class that we just had on Tuesday? We do that every Tuesday, by the way. Feel free to check it out. How was queer gym class? I couldn't make it this week. Love to make it next week. How are you? Uh, and, and you can have those spontaneous conversations uh, that make it feel a bit more real, a bit more authentic. Um, and so that's part of the, the way that we design this space and why we like it so much. Now, Evergreen and I are going to demonstrate how you can follow each other. So I'm going to follow Evergreen. So this is a little demo. If you come to this space, we realize that it's new for most people. And so it's pretty confusing. There are some how-to videos, and I've sent that link in the chat as well. You can also use that message that I sent in the chat. That's the message that we send to everyone uh, to give them a bit of background and to learn this. Evergreen just sent me a request to follow them. Hopefully you can see that on my screen. I'm going to click accept, and this is what our admins do every Saturday for worship. I'm going to click accept, and my avatar will now follow Evergreen without me having to touch anything. Evergreen's going to take us, yeah, first to my office over there. Lovely. The other thing about Gather Town is that you can link folks directly to a space. So for my office hours, uh, which you can access on the calendar out here by pressing X, uh, let me go over there for a second. Everything here is interactive. So if you see a calendar, you can interact with it and it shows you, for example, my office hours or when the queer gym class meets. Uh, and 
that's part of how we use the space as a physical space. Now I'm going to follow Evergreen again. And so this is a way for us to practice pastoral care, uh, for folks to drop in the space to have a chat. We also have personal space. So Evergreen just took us to their desk. Uh, this is a desk that Evergreen has been able to change the look of, to change the carpet, to change the color of the desk, to put some knickknacks there, um, whatever you want, so that everyone can also have some rights uh, to their own personal space. Evergreen, would you like to say uh, something about your experience of this space so far, what you like about it? And you can unmute in Zoom. I'm going to have to talk in Zoom because uh, Zoom is already taking access of my camera and mic, so I can't talk to you guys through GatherTown at the moment, but it does work just as JJ has described previously. Um, I really do enjoy uh, GatherTown just because um, it gives a great way to connect with a bunch of people uh, over a uh, virtual space that uh, feels very real, as JJ has described. Uh, and it has given me a lot of opportunities because of the lack of opportunity within uh, the Great Rivers Conference and the fact that there is a wide gap of affirming ministries from my location in Illinois to between where I am and the nearest reconciling ministry. Um, JJ has given me a lot of opportunities as the chair of hospitality for uh, YPC, and uh, it has given me a lot of opportunities to meet a lot of new friends, uh, to share my ministry in a way that makes sense for my generation, and uh, hopefully to spread that on to a whole bunch of new folk. I'm going to stop talking now. Yep. Thank you, Evergreen. And Evergreen does a fabulous job. Um, so we recently, and you can find this on our Instagram, um, we, that's mostly where we're active on Instagram. Uh, we have a lot of different events that take place in these different spaces. So we've, we're starting a Dungeons and Dragon D&D. Uh, &D, if you know some young people that are looking for a space, uh, there's a link um, that is on our Instagram, and we can also share it in this chat um, called next steps where you can sign up for uh, Dungeons and Dragons. We have uh, a queer gym class on Tuesdays. And so it's just a lot of different things to build community in a lot of different ways. Um, Evergreen is taking us to the gym area up here. Um, it's quite an extensive map. So we welcome you to come. Um, we probably won't be here after this today, but we have worship on Saturday. Um, and so we welcome you to come to worship at 9 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Central time and 12 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S. Uh, and we invite you to click the link that's here uh, to save that link and to join us for worship on Saturdays. So this is our sanctuary. This is our worship space. Um, this is where worship happens. What I like about it is that unlike Zoom, uh, there are these couches are designed to be personal uh, private areas. So if you are sitting around a couch, and I like this, it feels very Wesleyan. Um, and if you click the link, you you know Evergreen will probably admit you right now if you want to hang out in here too. Um, but so what I like about it is that our worship is designed to be small group oriented. So we have an opening prayer, some music that we share together, a reading of scripture, and I offer a five minute mini sermon. The rest of it, uh, the rest of worship is 10 minutes or more of group discussion in small groups around these tables. So you can only see and hear the people who are around your table, which also means that as the presenter, it's really nice for me because you all can be talking to say, did he just say uh, yada yada? And you can answer that around your table without it interrupting the speaker so that the worship can go and you can also engage in worship as it's happening around your small tables here in the um, couch areas. Uh, and when you stand up here by the microphones in the chancel area, then everyone in the room can see and hear you. And so this is where worship takes place. We have all these tiki torches and fire pits from our Pentecost services. Uh, so it, it also changes as the liturgical season changes because uh, we are nerds, as I said. Um, 
Now we also have a little prayer chapel over here uh, where we have different meditations. So if you're looking during the week uh, and, you know, for queer folks who don't have affirming spaces to go, or honestly, anyone who says the church is too far for me, or as we found the church is inaccessible, um, whatever that disability or neurodivergence might be, however, the church is inaccessible for you. We've worked very hard to try and make this an accessible place. Um, so for homebound folks, folks who can't uh, physically leave their houses or even their beds, you can join worship. You can participate uh, in worship as Evergreen showing your avatar can dance. Uh, so even if you can't dance where you are, your avatar can dance and Evergreen will show them the confetti one. Your avatar can also throw confetti. And I know we're running short on time here, so I'll continue on. Um, but there's there's just so much uh, that can be done. <laughs> the confetti is making my computer uh, really tired. Uh, but there's there's so much interaction that can be done, and um, we'll we'll stay here for for the end, Evergreen. Um, so there's there's a lot that can be done here. I'm going to send just one more link to you. So all of the links are in your chat. Uh, we have a community on Discord where we share announcements. And so I encourage you to click the Discord link if you wanna keep in touch and learn more. The other thing is we, uh, ah, and Barb saw the labyrinth. Actually, Evergreen, let's walk down uh, to the labyrinth uh, to show everyone that as we keep talking. Um, the other thing is that we, we are working, as I said, I've just been appointed to Young Prophets Collective as well to do this work, as well as being appointed to study. Uh, and so we need um, to be able to support a quarter time position. Um, so if you know folks or your churches are able to support this ministry, we have a GoFundMe there, um, or you can become a monthly giver on um, PayPal. And that link is also on our website and Instagram, all that jazz. Um, but really, we're working very hard to try and support a quarter time position. Um, and so if you or your churches are able to support that, the GoFundMe link is in there. Um, and so we just share that with you uh, with that in mind. So there's just so many possibilities that exist here. The other thing that we're doing um, and that I hope that your churches could partner with is that like any physical church, we don't just wanna be the only ones in here. So if you have a youth group and you think this would be a cool space for them, you're more than welcome to send us a message. We'll set up a time and you can use this space to say, oh, we wanna walk the virtual labyrinth or we wanna go to the racetrack. Yes, we have a racetrack. Uh, we wanna go to the racetrack, have a youth group night there. You know, we want to have a small group in this space. We are, if your churches want to participate in that, or for example, with Reconciling Ministries Network, now moving to more regional groups for churches where there isn't a reconciling church. If your regional group wants to gather somewhere, instead of having to travel for hours, you can meet in still a space that could feel like home um, or feel like a church um, and not have to go anywhere. So there's lots of possibilities for us to continue to be partners, to talk about this work. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. I will turn it back to Emily for our last few minutes uh, of questions, but I'm, I'm very grateful that you all stuck around to hear a little bit about this wacky queer ministry that we're doing. Uh, and I hope to see you on Saturday, maybe for worship. JJ, uh, this has been absolutely beautiful and fun and exactly what I expected it to be, that you would surprise us with some new adventures and some new opportunities. I hope that maybe you're like, what? And also like, that's awesome. Um, and everything in between. It is it is so good for us to have uh, people like JJ doing this kind of work. Um, Evergreen, I'm glad that you were able to help us demonstrate. Thank you for being um, a part of tonight as well. And um, what a cool and innovative community and uh, just a place for queer and trans and allies to really get to meet together in a, a very cool uh, virtual space. So JJ, thank you for sharing your passion with us, your heart with us, um, and telling us your story and um, YPC's story and inviting us in. Um, I will make these links um, available for, for you all. Um, we will send out the recording and some resources so that you can have those all in one place. Um, next week, uh, you'll get an email from um, through um, Eventbrite. So pay attention to Eventbrite because um, that's where the email will come from. Um, but again, thank you so much for gathering in this space uh, with us this evening. We are truly 
truly grateful to um, bring your voices um, and your passions uh, to life as it in encourages us all um, and reminds us that we are not alone. Um, if you have a crazy idea, maybe it's not so crazy after all, um, that there are people who can support you and journey with you and help you think it through. So JJ, thanks for being one of those places um, providing this space um, and being with us this evening. So just blessings to all of you as you go. Again, happy Pride Month. Um, may you be reminded that you are beautiful and beloved. Um, you are gods and uh, we are so grateful um, to be on this journey together with you. Go in peace this evening, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.